page 3 chapter literary types first tragedy question 1 discuss the nature of conflict and suffering in a tragedy answer conflict is the essence of drama quote no conflict no drama unquote as bernard shaw said it was a study of sophocles antigone that led the german philosopher and critic G. W. Hegel to stress the importance of moral conflict in tragedy. In Antigone, there is conflict between two principles, between the religious principle of giving burial to Antigone's brother and the legal principle of obeying the order of the king, Creon. The tragedy presents the internal conflict of Antigone between two duties as well as the external con conflict between Antigone and Creon. Antigone will give her brother burial according to religious sanctions and Creon orders her not to bury brother who is a traitor. Both stick to their stance and both become obstinate and arrogant. Antigone defies the king and buries her brother in the darkness of the night. Creon condemns Antigone to death. He becomes tyrannical and even does not listen to his son Haemon who loves Antigone. When Creon realizes the mistake, it is too late. Antigone has killed herself and Haemon is going to follow her example. What is important in a tragedy is the moral conflict. Antigone suffers the conflict between two duties and Creon also undergoes the conflict between his duty as king and his duty as the uncle and protector of Antigone who loves his son. In Romeo and Juliet, there is conflict between love and duty beside the external conflict between two parties. Shakespeare's tragedy is poignant for this moral conflict. Julius Caesar suffers the insurrection of in his soul between friendship and patriotism. Hamlet is torn between duty to the injunction of his father's host and his moral sensibility. Macbeth murders but he is tormented by the compunctious visitings. This internal conflict gives the drama psychological depth and spiritual dimension. It intensifies the tragedy of the hero. In modern tragedy, the tragic conflict is mainly based on the conflict between two opposed social forces. In Galsworthy's place, there is the conflict between society and individuals. In Justice, the hero folder is pitted against vast civilization. It represents the conflict between humanitarian aspect of law and its legal aspect. Strife analyzes the conflict between two page, page four sides in an industrial dispute. In Eliot's murder in the cathedral, the conflict is between Beckett's conscience and his duty to the state. In Shaw's St. Joan, which is a poignant tragedy, there is the conflict between Catholicism and individualism. Shaw is mainly a comedian and he always presents two opposed points of view and the comic intensity arises from the contest between two points of view and the final triumph of Shaw's view. Conflict is the essence of drama and this is developed through exposition, complication, crisis and ultimately result in catastrophe or denouement. The conflict is suggested in the exposition. It intensifies through the second and third acts and reaches the climax in the third act. Action falls through the fourth and fifth act and then ends in death and disaster in a tragedy and happy union in a comedy. Aristotle suggests this dramatic development in his stress on prologue, peripety, and anagnorisis in his division into two parts, complication and denouement. 
the paths must be organically connected with each other. One may begin at the beginning as in King Lear or in the middle as in Macbeth or at the end as in Oedipus and Antigone. But the different paths must have logical and sequential development. There must not be loose ends. Conflict of the tragedy in bracket drama bracket close is suggested in the exposition which explains the situations and provides information for the proper understanding of the play. In Greek drama, it is done by the prologue. In Macbeth, the first scene suggests the moral forces of the tragedy through the introduction of the witches. The second and third scenes are devoted to the exposition of the situation and characters. Moral conflict is indicated in Macbeth's meeting with the witches and their prophecies. Then there is the complication at Macbeth goes on to his murderous career. But the moral conflict is depicted all through. It reaches the crisis or climax with the murder of Lady Macduff and her son. Then the resolution starts. It is always a problem in the tragedian to keep the interest of the audience through the fourth and fifth act. The reversal of fortune is followed by discovery or recognition. Macbeth realizes his folly. His moral conflict is resolved into his realization and enlightenment. The external conflict is resolved in the defeat of Macbeth and the assumption of the reign by Malcolm. Order that is distributed both in the internal world of Macbeth and the external world of Scotland is restored. The crisis of the logical and natural outcome of all that has gone before and the catastrophe follows naturally and inevitably from the crisis. Page 5. Question number 2. How would you differentiate between classical and romantic tragedy? Answer. In England, there were some attempts at neoclassical tragedy of Seneca and comedy of Plotus and Terence, in bracket, Gorboduke and Ralph Royster Bolster, bracket closed. Humanists like Sidney backed neoclassicism. But English drama under the guidance of Marlowe, Green, Lilly, and later Shakespeare established an independent type of drama known as Romantic drama. The Spanish Romantic drama of the 17th century, best known to us in the work of its two chief masters, Lope de Vega and Calderon, has had influence on the Italian French and English drama. These dramas are theatrical. Its interest depends on incident and intrigue. The Elizabethan and Jacobian drama is essentially romantic. The German drama of Lessing, Goethe and Schiller and French drama of Dumas, Victor Hugo are romantic. The finest examples of neoclassic drama are Cornelia, Racine and Voltaire. In England, Dryden essayed the neoclassical type in its limited sense. Neoclassic tragedy followed the classic model in the general nature of its subjects and in the way in which these subjects were treated. Classic drama dealt with great legends of a remote mythical age. Its chief characters had been majestic heroes who belonged to a world of tradition, and in its handling of such themes and persons, it had sought a purely poetic rendering in harmony with them. Thus, the dialogue was kept throughout at the ideal tragic pitch of stateliness and nobility. However, in Achilles and Euripides, there was an occasional approach to the tone of common life through the use of homely phrases and realistic detail. Ideal treatment 
and unity of tone were the theoretical principles of Greek tragic art. The classical drama observed unities of action, time and place and used chorus for commenting on the action of the drama and for singing odes. The alteration of stasimon in bracket choral odes bracket close and episodes constitutes the structure of a classical tragedy. It excludes subplots and autonomous characters and seeks to achieve concentration and unity. In the Latin drama of Seneca, the elevated, stately and rhetorical style is maintained. The subjects were drawn from a great variety of sources but they are always aristocratic in quality. Tragedy always required characters raised above the common plane. In treatment, the neoclassics were more consistently classic than the Greek themselves. No attempt to mirror ordinary life or to reproduce common human nature was ever permitted. Unity of tone was preserved by the page 6 banishment from the dialogue of everything savouring of colloquialism or anything suggestive of familiarity. Romantic tragedy is aristocratic in character. It is concerned with the struggles and misfortunes of more or less illustrious people. Tragic heroes or heroines of like Tamburlin, Dr. Foster's Macbeth, King Lear, the Duchess of Malfi are kings, emperors, general of armies. But it is their human worth that is emphasized. Tamburlaine, born a peasant, has been raised to a great general. Hamlet is more a humanist scholar than a prince. King Lear comes to recognize himself as an unaccommodated man. Secondly, no attempt is made to preserve the ideal atmosphere of unity of tone. The tragic hero is often set in a world of commonplace men in things. The dialogue, though predominantly poetical, is often racy with colloquialism and has many touches of familiarity. The high characters and low characters mingle. The grand blank verse often gives way to racy colloquial prose. Realistic details like Lear's famous quote, pray you undo this button, unquote, abound, which to neoclassic playwrights and critics would appear shockingly vulgar. Classical and neoclassical drama is entirely ideal, but the romantic tragedy combines the idealistic with the realistic. In the classical and neoclassical tragedy, there is complete separation between tragedy and comedy. Romantic tragedy introduces comic elements and thus achieves variety of effect. This intermingling of tragedy and comedy is a legacy to the Elizabethan drama from the native dramas like miracles and moralities. Romantic tragedy does not adhere to the principle of the un unities of action, time and place. Unity of action is observed in a different manner, but unities of time and place are completely dispensed with. Aristotle prescribed the unity of action and casually refers to the unities of time and place, but the French neoclassicists insisted on three unities as rigorous principles of dramatic art. Classical drama in its rigorous acceptation of the unity of action meant a single plot undiversified by episodes and uncomplicated by subordinate incidents and characters. In romantic tragedy, subplots and subordinate characters are allowed to provide diversity and amplitude to the tragedy. But it achieves connection and coherence between the different episodes and characters. 
all elements of the plot and subordinate characters are woven together and made interdependent as cooperating factors in the evolution of plot as a whole. Romantic tragedy combines complexity with unity. Page 7. In King Lear, two stories are dovetailed into a coherent whole resulting in the universalization of Lear tragedy. Classical and neoclassical drama is a drama of narrative. Every action is reported, murderers and melodrama are not allowed on the stage. But romantic drama is essentially a drama of action. Everything happens on the stage. Duels are fought, murders and suicides are committed, battles waged in the full view of the audience. The spectators reveled in these scenes. There were many crudities like the battle scenes ridiculed by Ben Johnson. However, a great dramatist like Shakespeare could show the artistic sense in the matter of exhibition of action. In Macbeth, the most terrible murder, the murder of Duncan, takes place off stage. In Shakespearean tragedy, in bracket romantic tragedy, bracket closed, action and narrative often combine. The flight of Malcolm and Donald Bain to England and Ireland provides an example of narrative condensation. The death of Lady Macbeth is not shown. Shakespeare achieves greater artistic effect by showing Lady Macbeth walking in sleep. Modern tragedy is eclectic and experimental. Three unities are not adhered to as a matter of principle, but they are observed in many plays as for example, Singh's Rider to the Sea, Ibsen's Ghosts, Hedda Gabler, etc. Changes of scenes hardly take place in modern drama. Another important difference between the classical drama and romantic drama lies in the representation of an action. Romantic drama unrestricted in respect of time and place would represent the whole of a story. But Greek tragedy confined its actions to the closing portion of the story, the antecedents being explained by dialogue and retrospective narrative. In Oedipus the King, the action begins at the moment when the predi predictions of the oracle are about to be fulfilled. But in Macbeth, the action begins with the rise of the motive of ambition in Macbeth's mind. In Ibsen's drama, the structural plan of Greek drama is found. The action begins with the last term of a long series of events and the antecedents are narrated in the course of the action. Exposition continues through the action belongs indeed to its very substance. Question 3. What according to you are the essential features of a tragic hero? Discuss with appropriate references. Answer. According to Aristotle, in tragedy, quote, number one, a good man must not be seen passing from happiness to misery, or two, a bad man from misery to happiness. The first situation is not fear inspiring. Page 8 or piteous, but simply odious to us. The second is the most untragic that can be. It has none of the requisites of tragedy. It does not appeal either to the human feeling in us or to our pity or to our fears. Nor on the other hand should, number three, an extremely bad man be seen falling from happiness to misery. Such a story may arouse some human feelings in us, but it will not move us to either pity or fear. Pity is occasioned by undeserved misfortune and fear by that of one like ourselves. 
so that there will be nothing either piteous or fear inspiring in the situation. There remains then the intermediate kind of personage, a man not preeminently virtuous and just, whose misfortune, however, is brought upon him not by vice and depravity, but by some error of judgment of the number of those in the enjoyment of great reputation and prosperity, for example, Oedipus, Thisbis and the men of note of similar families." Unquote. In bracket, Poetics by Waters translation, bracket close. Thus it is pointed out here that the tragic hero must be neither quote, a good man nor a bad man, unquote, but an quote, intermediate kind of personage, unquote, neither preeminently virtuous or just nor preeminently vicious or wicked one, quote, in the enjoyment of great reputation and prosperity, unquote. He is a big man and a great man, with yet a flaw in character. His misfortune is the result not, quote, of vice or depravity, unquote, but of, quote, some error of judgment, unquote. Quote, hamartia, unquote, in Aristotle's language. Hamartia etymologically means missing the mark. Aristotle had Oedipus in bracket along with this this bracket close in mind when he worked out his definition. Oedipus's decision to fly from Corinth and the foul deeds he committed afterwards cannot be said to have been due to an error of judgment or a moral frailty. His flight from Corinth was a sensible decision and his killing of liars was largely in self-defense. His pride and obstinacy to believe what Tiresias, Creon and other characters say about him may be called his hamartia. Pride leads to his error of judgment and consequently causes his spiritual crisis which is the real tragedy. Agamemnon's desire to appease the gods is his hamartia. Clytemenstra is overmastered by a passion to kill Agamemnon and so is Orestes. Medea is similarly overtaken by passion to kill her children to take revenge on her husband. These passions lead to their errors of judgment which cause their tragedies. However, it must be noted that in Greek tragedies, Characters are guided by divine commands and they rush to predetermined end shaped by the gods. They may have illusions about their conduct, but the tragedy, page 9, is not precipitated by their errors, which is derived from, quote, ignorance of some material fact or circumstance, unquote. Oedipus set in motion voluntarily with a good end in view the whole train of action which aims to discover the polluted person and realize these from the plague. He is ignorant of the circumstance that he has killed his own father and the discovery of the fact produces a result other than what he expected. Agamemnon kills his daughter, little knowing what will be the consequence. Othello strangled his wife to death, led by the facile belief that Desdemona is unfaithful. All these characters are ignorant of the material fact. Hamartia is connected with peripety and anagorysis hang together in the ideal schematization of tragic plot. Dr. Smart has challenged the view of Aristotle that a wholly innocent person cannot be the hero of a tragedy. 
in bracket essays and studies volume 8 bracket closed he points out that the four gospels present a history of suffering inflicted on perfect innocents they have been read with the deepest interest and the profoundest emotion the stories of saints and martyrs in christian literature have been for centuries with absorbing attention heroic greatness and perfect guiltiness are the secret of their power drink water has written a tragedy of abraham lincoln who is a blameless hero shaw's saint john is a poignant tragedy and john is a blameless character in the antigone of sophocles one notices a refutation of aristotle's theory she has to choose between contending duties duty to religion and duty to the state she sacrifices the lower duty to the higher butcher says quote blameless goodness has seldom the quality needed to make it dramatically interesting dramatic character implies some self assertive energy it has generally a touch of egoism by which it exercises a controlling influence over circumstances or over the wills of minor characters that are grouped around it goodness on the other hand with its unselfish self effacing tendency is apt to be immobile and uncombative in refusing to stick back it brings the action to a standstill unquote shaw has made his heroine in bracket john bracket close a combative saint saint a saint who is also remarkably swift in action one who strikes hard at established authority the tragedy of john resides in others who fail to recognize absolute reality the secret cause when it appears in flesh the tragedy of john is tragedy of christ court must then a christ perish in torment in every age to save those that have not im- imagination unquote ts eliot has written the tragedy of martyrdom in murder in the cathedral becket says quote we are not here to triumph page 10 by fighting by stratagem or by resistance we have only to conquer now by suffering unquote there is an unmistakable tragic sense in the sufferings and tortures of becket and saint john aristotle is however right in the assertion that a positively bad man cannot be the hero of a tragedy colossal villainy may dazzle our eyes but it does not touch the heart in tragedy there must be a sense of waste the misfortune that comes upon the hero is more or less undeserved and lago and iago cannot be a tragic hero but macbeth can iago is wicked from the beginning and by nature but macbeth is at first noble he is veller's minion and bellona's by bridegroom there is an impression that his essential self is disintegrated by his ambition and forces which he meets and which he cannot control macbeth's life is tragic it awakens a sense of waste shakespeare enlists our sympathy in his favor even when he murders thus the precise task of the tragic dramatist is to reproduce the distinctive features of a man and at the same time without losing the likeness make him handsome than he and summer than he is in bracket poetics bracket closed of shakespeare's tragic characters bradley says that they coat are made of the stuff we find within ourselves and within the persons who surround them 
but by an intensification of the life which they share with others, they are raised above them. Unquote. Question 4. What is the function of pity and terror in the tragic experience? Give illustrative examples. Answer. Aristotle in chapter 6 of the Poetic, Poetics offers a definition of tragedy which has served as a starting point for every modern critic who has attempted to describe the effect of a play of this kind. He indicates the function of tragedy and the peculiar pleasure that tragedy gives rise to. He says that tragedy must deal with quote, incidents arousing pity and fear, wherewith to accomplish its catharsis of such emotions, unquote. In section 13, he adds that, quote, it must imitate actions arousing pity and fear, since that is the distinctive function of this kind of imitation, unquote. Section 14 states that tragedy has its own pleasure. Quote, not every kind of pleasure should be required of a tragedy, but only its own pleasure. Unquote. It clarifies the standpoint by adding that, quote, tragic pleasure is the, that of pity and fear. Unquote. Tragedy has indeed a paradox. While tragedy in life pains us, tragedy in literature pleases us. Tragedy is a spectacle of calamity and sufferings, yet it gives us pleasure. Aristotle explains this paradox by saying that its pleasure consists in the catharsis of pity and fear. Aristotle was speaking in medical terms. By catharsis, he means, page 11, quote, purgation, unquote, Quote, elimination by irritating drugs, unquote. It suggests, quote, expulsion by excitation, unquote. Tragedy expels pity and fear by exciting them. The pleasure of tragedy, therefore, consists in the pleasure of relief from the oppressive burden of the painful feelings of pity and fear. These feelings are aroused by the spectacle of tragedy and at the end they are expelled. Pity and fear are unwholesome feelings experienced by the audience during a tragic performance. But at the end they are expelled and calm is restored to the audience. This is in short Aristotle's concept of catharsis. Aristotle's doctrine of catharsis is an answer to Plato's criticism of dramatic art in the Republic. Tragic drama calls forth pity for the distress of its heroes and this, Plato thinks, will render us liable to self-pity instead of endurance when we meet misfortune ourselves. Pity is therefore antagonistic to virtue. In bracket, as Plato understands virtue, bracket closed. And the attempt to control pity requires the banishment of the art that fosters it. Aristotle seeks to defend tragedy while retaining Plato's criterion of justification. Harmful emotions must have some outlet. Let them boil up at mere representations and then the soul will be less troubled by them on real occasions of misfortune. In opposition of Plato's views that the capacity for emotion grows with exercise, Aristotle puts forward the doctrine that when our feelings are stored, we blow off steam and so are purged. He does not question Plato's ethical tenet that pity is a bad thing. Plato seeks speaks only of pity, but Aristotle adds fear. In his rhetoric, in bracket, book 2, chapter 5 and 8, bracket close, Aristotle regards pity and fear as mere relations. 
According to Aristotle, the principal aim of tragedy is to arouse pity and fear by drawing dramatic pictures of suffering and also to effect a catharsis. There is, however, dispute not only about the meaning of catharsis but also about what it applies to. Most of the interpreters opine that it is a process working on the minds of spectators. For it is they who feel the effect of tragedy. G. F. Else and others point out that the cathartic process has only indirect reference to emotions or spectacles. Its primary concern is with the structure of the plot. About the meaning of catharsis, the traditional view put forward by Lessing was that catharsis means purification. To Plato's charge that tragedy fills the mind with soft emotions like pity and sorrow. Aristotle's answer is that it rouses these emotions only to purify them as men are purified or cleansed from pollution by quote lustration unquote or expiatory rites. It is assumed that some people are excessively prone to pity or fear or grief and if this excessive page 12 pronounces is curbed they may as a result of their experience of tragic drama be cured of this infirmity and become healthy normal men. But Lessing points out that tragic pity must not only purify the soul of him who has too much pity but also of him who has too little. This view is however rejected by most modern interpreters who explain catharsis as a medical metaphor meaning purgation or evacuation. This is the view of Bywater and Butcher. These interpreters rely chiefly on a passage in the politics. Quote, those who are influenced by pity or fear and every emotional nature must have a like experience and others in so far as each is susceptible to such emotions and all are in a manner purged and their souls lightened and delighted. Unquote. But the two interpretations are not as wide apart as might appear at first sight. Both these theories lay emphasis on the curative value of the process and the restoration to normalcy affected by it. Morgoliot Potingalen says that catharsis means quote, qualitative evacuation of what is troublesome. Not excretion but restoration to equilibrium. Unquote. These theories are, however, objected to on the ground that they give a misleading account of the pleasure we derive from tragedy. According to this view, pleasure is derived after the burden of pollution of excessive humor are taken off. There would be a calm of mind only when all passions are spent. But in reality, our joy is greatest when our agony is most intense. In the horrors of the Erinais in Aeschylus, in the storm scene in King Lear, or in the scene of Desdemona's murder in Othello, it is not that Quote, the pain gives way to pleasure, unquote, as Butcher argues, but that the pain is pleasure. Eritotel's concept of catharsis has been severely criticized by the modern critics. F. L. Lucas says that, quote, the theatre is not a hospital, unquote. Fontanelle points out, quote, I have never understood how the passions are purged by the passions themselves." Unquote. A modern playwright, Jean Anauhill, 
assures his audience that no disturbing emotions are stirred up by tragedy. Quote, most of all, it's restful is tragedy because you know that there is no more hope, dirty sneaking hope that you are caught, caught at last like a rat in a trap. Unquote. In bracket, first speech of the chorus in Antigone. Bracket closed. Dr. I. A. Richards has seen the two emotions, pity and fear, as opposing forces which tragedy brings into a state of equilibrium. In bracket, principles of literary criticism. Bracket closed. Chu Huang Xin regards the pleasure of tragedy as a pleasure that always accompanies overflowing life and intense activity. In bracket, the psychology of tragedy, page 90, bracket closed. Modern critics observe that pleasure of tragedy consists in, continued in the next five.